Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. Welcome to you wherever you are, here in the physical space of our beautiful sanctuary, or joining us from your sanctuary in front of the screen. We're so honored you have set aside the time to be together this morning, a morning that comes after two weeks of incredible pain and grief, a morning in which joining in community takes on enhanced meaning as we hold in our hearts those whose lives were extinguished by hatred and the scourge of gun violence. On this day, it's so important to affirm that we at the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara are a diverse community of seekers where all people of goodwill are welcome. In this community, we strive to live with integrity, nurture wonder, and inspire the actions that will transform us and transform the world. We'd like to extend a special welcome to visitors joining us for the first time. If you'd like to keep in touch or learn more about the Unitarian Society, please stop by the welcome table in the courtyard. Or if you're joining us remotely, please sign our virtual guest book, available both on Zoom and Facebook. My name is Ellen Broidy, and I'm a member of the Worship Arts team. I'm joined this morning by music director Matthew Grisette, pianist Heather Levin, members of the choir, and director of Lifespan Education, Charlotte Briganti. Behind the scenes, Eden Kennedy is monitoring the Zoom chat and Facebook comments function. John Diaz is in charge of sound. Cameron McKinley is managing the cameras, and Amber Asher is doing something I don't completely understand, but it has to do with showing you the videos. Okay. And later on, members of our community will be sharing reflections about various meanings of Memorial Day. There are lots of ways to become involved in the life of this vibrant community. I want you all to remember that our annual meeting will take place at 11.30 next Sunday, June 5th, in Parish Hall. Also, that day is our annual flower communion, so if you plan to be joining us in the sanctuary, please bring a flower. And I'd like to invite Lorraine Gray to the lectern for a special announcement. As she said, I'm Lorraine Gray. I'm a member of the membership ministry team. And I thought I was going to have a surprise, but uh, I forgot that I asked Eden to put it in the bulletin. We are going to have the fashion fling again. So ladies, woohoo! start going through your closets for all that, the COVID the gain that, the shrinkage, the COVID shrinkage of those clothes. So we are going to have it in Jefferson Hall again. It'll be July 9th for the, the girlfriend evening with wine and chocolate and other goodies. And then the next morning, we invite other churches, other women to come. Uh, I need a team, because it takes a whole team, to do this. So if you're interested in helping during or before, we have publicity, all kinds of things to do. So remember those dates, it's July 9th and 10th, and we can bring the clothes the week before. Can't put them on the, the stage like we used to. We'll put them right down in Jefferson. So July 3rd, you can bring those clothes. So start going through things. Thank you. If you're interested, come see me. Okay, and lastly, we hope you'll join us after service for coffee hour in the courtyard or via Zoom. Now take a deep breath. Settle yourself comfortably wherever you are. Center your body and mind and soul. And as the sound of the bowl gong rings out, please open the doors to your heart and join us together in our time of worship. I'd like to invite my spouse, Joan Ariel, to the lectern to share with us the words for this morning's chalice lighting. Joan. Good morning. If you're joining us virtually and have a chalice or a candle to light, please, sorry about that, I forgot to take off my mask. 
please do so now and enter into the chat or the comments, Chalice is Lit On, and the name of your street or town. While we cannot see the flames, we know that they are burning bright throughout our community. This morning, we light our chalice in honor of those who have served and those who continue to serve at home and abroad, in war and for peace. We offer our gratitude and prayers in recognition of the gifts and sacrifices they have made on our behalf. And we light our chalice in remembrance of all those who have died in Ukraine, in all the seemingly unceasing wars across our fragile world, and in our own broken country. While we may not witness it in our lifetimes, as Reverend Julia encourages us, we hold fast to our discipline of hope and reaffirm our commitment to work together toward the day when weapons of war will be abolished and war itself will be no more. This morning, we also light a candle to remember those who most recently lost their precious and irreplaceable lives to gun violence in Buffalo and Uvalde. May their memory be a blessing. Every Sunday, we take a moment to reflect upon what's good and positive in our world and to acknowledge these good and positive gestures by adding them to our virtual hope jar. This morning, I would like to lift up the extraordinary World Central Kitchen. Since 2010, Chef Jose Andres and his dedicated team have brought hope to some of the most vulnerable and dangerous spots on Earth. Partnering with people on the ground, World Central Kitchen provides warm and sustaining food to communities quite literally living on the edge. And as we speak, Andres and his team are preparing and serving more than 300,000 meals daily for the people driven from their homes by the war in Ukraine. World Central Kitchen offers hope in the most concrete ways by providing nourishment for the body and for the spirit. If you've been moved by something that brought you hope, please type it into the chat or share with your friends during coffee hour. We need all the hope we can collect and share.
Now can you hear me? Yes, okay. I'm gonna just start that over. <laughs> Thank you to the choir for that beautiful rendition of Where Have All the Flowers Gone. In RE today, we are going to be planting flowers because planting a garden is an act of hope. And the, the, month, the worship theme for May was beauty, and so we're going to be culminating by planting this beautiful pollinator garden right on the other side of this wall here that you can come see later on. Do any of you know what a pollinator is? An animal that pollinates plants. Yes, yes, um, um, so a lot of our native plants need pollinators to, um, to bring pollen from the plant to other plants, and that's the only way they can reproduce and, and thrive. Um, can you name a pollinator? A bee. A bee, yes. A bat. A bat, yes, some bats I think are pollinators. Butterflies, hummingbirds. So um, bees in particular, I'm glad you brought up bees, Dylan. Who, who here has been stung by a bee? Anyone ever been stung by a bee? Oh, a lot of people have been stung by a bee. Well, we're going to be planting flowers. I've got my gloves on. I've even got my pollinator hat on. We're going to be planting flowers that will attract bees. And um, so I've got a song that might help you avoid being stung by a bee. So we're going to do it. I'm going to do it. It's called The Way of the Bees. If you don't bother them, then they won't bother you. Tell you most of the time, you will find that it's true. If you let them go home, let them fly through the trees. They'll leave you alone, that's the way of the bees. The bee only stings when he's frightened or sad. He won't do a thing if you don't make him mad. Do not step on his wings. Do not not threaten or tease. If you scare him, he stings. That's the way of the bees. If you don't bother them, then they won't bother you. Tell you most of the time, you will find that it's true. If you let them go home, let them fly through the trees. They'll leave you alone. That's the way of the bees. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So we're, we're going to head out and plant some hope now. We'll see you later. For this morning's meditation, I'd like to offer a portion of a peacemaking prayer, a poem by the Reverend Eric Cherry. The history is complex. The politics are intense. The fear and anger are overwhelming, and the future is unclear. But glimpses of a hopeful vision will not be bombed into oblivion by anyone. In prayer meditation, we call to mind the peacemakers neighbors of differing faiths, with different histories, with different politics, with different emotions, who find room for each other in their hearts, in their dreams, and in their lives. Those who hold firmly to a vision of peace and justice anywhere in the world, but especially today in Ukraine, and I'd like to add Buffalo and Uvalde. In honor of Memorial Day, we've asked three members of our community to share reflections on their military service. Mike Gorodevsky is on a special birthday trip with his daughters, so Eileen Bunning has graciously stepped forward to bring Mike's words to us. Eileen? remembered. 
Thank you, Ellen. That was lovely. And yes, I'm not Mike, but I'm going to read his words that he would like to share with you. I know Mike wishes he could be here to share his own reflections, but he's traveling with his two daughters, and he is having a wonderful time celebrating his birthday. And it's my honor to read this. And so I quote, it was the 1980s, and I was a PhD working in the mental health field. I was sitting around a large conference table with perhaps 15 other social workers. We were reviewing resumes. Harriet said, oh, I would never hire a veteran. I sat up from my meeting stupor and turned to Harriet. So you wouldn't have hired me? Across the room, Sand said, I was in the Air Force. Harriet began stammering and stuttering and apologizing. Oh, Mike, you were in the Army? You don't look like somebody who would have been in the Army. And I thought, tell me, Harriet, what should I look like? Reflect ba reflecting back, to the 60s. It was 1966. I had completed my undergraduate work from Berkeley. Sarah and I were now married and living in Berkeley, California. I was drafted in October of 1966. About 46,000 young men were drafted that one month. Yes, it really was 46,000. I looked it up. Our country was caught up in the Vietnam War. Many of my fellow draftees would be sent into combat. After basic training, I was assigned to combat medical school at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. After several months, I received my orders to leave Fort Sam. Many of my peers were heading over to Vietnam. I was shocked to find out I was going to fly home to the Bay Area. I was assigned to work at the Presidio in San Francisco. I would be sent to Letterman Army Hospital near the foot of the Golden Gate Bridge. I was to be a social worker, specialist, Private Michael Gordeski. One morning, I was heading back to Letterman, walking under a freeway overpass, the pass overpass that leads to the Golden Gate Bridge. This overpass was high above the hospital and teeming with traffic. I was struck by the way that the civilian world continued to proceed in their morning commute without any parent knowledge of the hundreds of Vietnam wounded below healing and being cared for in Letterman. Each day, I ate lunch in the mess hall with the enlisted staff and patients. The patients wore blue pajamas. The staff wore starched white uniforms. Officers ate in a separate dining room. Over lunch, we heard the stories that Vietnam, that were, we heard the, of the stories that were not suited for the sensitive viewers of NBC Nightly News. And I quote, Charlie over there still has pieces of bamboo in him. The blast just embedded splinters all over. At my table was every conceivable injury one could imagine. Men with burns, amputations, wounds in various parts of their body, and a wild assortment of contraptions that held men in odd positions while healing their bodies. Although as a draftee, I was only in the Army for two years, it was a profound experience for many reasons. As an enlisted soldier, I moved exclusively in a world of my peers. Officers, while usually civil to us, were not my friends or even colleagues. It was there that I met young men who had joined the military to get out of dreadful poverty. 
I met men who were delighted to be there and have three square meals a day. For many, the army was better than civilian life. I also learned lessons about social class and racism. I was assigned to a small group of social workers. Every enlisted man and woman in my unit was black. In the 1960s, they would describe themselves as black. They became my friends and co-workers. They were mostly career soldiers, and they taught me their understanding of how to navigate a complex bureaucracy. Most importantly, they helped me understand just a bit about the black experience. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, all of my fellow social workers taught me how very little I understood about Dr. King's significance to the black community. They were devastated. Devastated as if a father or brother had been killed. Their grief was profound, and I was becoming aware of how naive I was. My fellow black social workers often shared their experience with receiving continuous petty racial ins insults. Today, they would be known as microaggressions. For example, I co-authored a study with a black sergeant. My white officers instructed me to take his name off the study, implying he could not have contributed anything important to the paper. My friends also taught me to stay in my place as an enlisted person. One evening, I was asked by one of the ward physicians that I had been working very closely with to bring my wife over to his home for dinner. I hesitated, but I liked the doctor, and so we went to Marin for dinner. The next day, the whole ward was talking about what I had done and how I had violated the wall between officers and enlisted. My sergeant told me, Mike, that sort of thing is not done. You should not do that again. Needless to say, I never did. Completing my tour and leaving the Army in 1968, I went straight to graduate school to UCLA to continue my studies in social work and was immediately plunged into the world of educated and typically successful professionals. I was now a new social class, the intelligentsia, some might call it. In this class, I rarely met any veterans who had been enlisted. I met veterans but they were typically officers. My fellow graduate students were uniformly against the war. I had served in the Army, but I rarely spoke of my experience. Finally, I want to end with a moment of my personal experience here at the Unitarian Society. At a Memorial Day service more than 10 years ago, the minister invited the veterans to stand up to be acknowledged. My own sacrifice had been really minimal. I thought of all the wounded. I did not stand up. It seemed the proper thing for me to do. On behalf of Mike, thank you. Thank you so much, Mike and Eileen. Every week, the Unitarian Society gives a portion of our Sunday offering to support projects and community partners that share our deepest values. This month, we're supporting the Audubon Society of Santa Barbara. Please give as generously if you can, and if you are joining virtually, use the text to give number on your screen. Please join with me in saying the affirmation of gratitude and giving, also, I believe, on the screen. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. 
Let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. And let us be grateful even for our needs, so that we may learn from the generosity of others. Joe Fior contributed the next reflection. Joe is also out of town, but generously agreed to add his voice to our service this morning via a pre-recorded video. Good morning, I'm Joe Fior. This morning, I'm reflecting on Memorial Day. What I think of Memorial Day now is different than what I thought of Memorial Day in my youth. When I was young, it seemed like Memorial Day was like other national holidays that celebrated some type of greatness in what we considered our exceptional country. What would be exceptional is figuring out ways to not have war. I thought of Memorial Day like the 4th of July, something we celebrated. Of course, for many Americans, it is just a three-day weekend, but it should not be any of these. It should be a national day of mourning, not only for the many men and women serving in the armed forces who have made the ultimate sacrifice, but for civilians who also had their lives cut short because of the horrors 
of armed conflicts. It should be more than a two minute news story showing President whoever and his first lady placing a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. We should all take some time on Memorial Day to remember someone. I'm sure we all know someone who lost their life to war. Most of the people in, armed, in our armed forces who lose their lives are young adults. When we think of them, I hope you think of them in the way I do, how their lives were cut short, how they were not allowed to have a life like many of us have had. One that has led to old age, a life with partnership, children, grandchildren, careers, accomplishments, and of course, disappointments and failures. When I returned to the civilian life from the US Navy in 1968, like many Americans, I still believed the Vietnam War was just. I believed in the domino theory. Like my shipmates, I grew up on a steady diet of Hollywood styled war. Nothing but glory, very little of the real life consequences. But something happened after 1968. I began educating myself on Vietnam and the Vietnam Vietnamese people and what the war was doing to them and their country. Sure, we had to stop Hitler and the Japanese empire in World War II, but the human cost of stopping communism was not worth it. I began to find out about my schoolmates who did not come back from Vietnam, schoolmates who like me had most of their lives still to live. I always think of my classmate and friend, Bob, who didn't make it back alive from Vietnam. A young man my age, whose own country put his family in an internment camp in World War II because of his race. His family got out of that camp, built a successful business in Santa Barbara. His family prospered. Bobby enlisted to serve his country. I would like to leave you this morning with a story I heard from Al Franken. It's part of a quote from his good friend who was dying named Tom Davis. Accept the fact that in the foreseeable future, I will be a dead person. I want to remind you that dead people are people too. There are good dead people and bad dead people. Some of my best friends are dead people. Dead people have fought in every war. Some of my best friends are dead people. Some of my best friends are dead people. That statement rings true for me. People should not have their lives cut short by something as pointless as war. I hope on this Memorial Day, you will remember that and remember someone. It's part of a quote from his good friend who was dying named Tom Davis. Accept the fact that in the foreseeable future I will be a dead person. I want to remind you that dead people are people too. There are good dead people and bad dead people. Some of my best friends are dead people. Dead people have fought in every war. Some of my best friends are dead people. Some of my best friends are dead people. That's
should not have their lives cut short by something as pointless as war. I hope on this memorial day you will remember that and remember some. I'd like to invite Howard Wittash up to the lectern, our third veteran who's going to speak with us this morning. Howard. Good morning. My name is Howard Wittosh. I served in the U.S. Navy from 1967 to 1970. I was in Vietnam. Memorial Day is about remembering those who put their lives in harm's way and made the ultimate sacrifice in the service of their country. Today, however, we remember the children of Uvalde and Buffalo and their families. And what a far cry that tragedy, those tragedies are from what we think we are as Americans. I have never known anyone killed in combat. I have known many who served in the military who are now deceased, but no one in my family and none of my friends were injured or died in combat. So I question my right to speak to you today. Memorial Day for me is remembering my time in service, what it meant then, what it means now. It all started with my family. My Czechoslovakian father came to the U.S in 1922 with his Jewish-Italian mother. During World War II, because he spoke many languages and knew the terrain of Western Europe, he served as an intelligence officer for the Office of Strategic Services. From behind a curtain, he witnessed and verified translations of interrogators and responses of Nazis in Germany, in German, regarding prisoners, death camps, stolen art and gold. I learned this from my mother because my father never told me about his military experience or his European heritage. In his mind, military service was a citizen's duty. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz would have referred to my mother as the daughter of settlers. Her line goes back to the English colony of Virginia and traces west to Missouri in the 1800s. Her forebears and family members include uncles, cousins and nephews, and my cousins who graduated from the Naval Academy at Annapolis and who served in the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, and Operation Desert Storm. On my mother's side, military service was a family tradition. <clears throat> As required in 1960, I registered for the draft in Chicago, a stronghold of political conservatism, and applied for and received a Navy scholarship to Stanford University, another bastion of conservatism in those days. After two years, I transferred to Berkeley, the epicenter of West Coast liberalism, free speech, civil rights, and anti-war protests. In 1966 at Berkeley, I gave a Memorial Day speech on the steps of Sproul Hall to honor those who died for their country. The speech fell on deaf ears. That fall, I was appointed to the Navy Civil Engineer Corps to serve, in my mind, without killing people. I was quickly reminded that my non-combatant status 
did not stop those who did the killing. In NROTC, I learned about the chain of command and following orders. Lieutenant Kennedy taught a class on unlawful orders, which taught that we could question authority and, and, and consider whether an order was lawful or not. To do this, however, required specific knowledge of Navy regs and a keen sense of the difference between right and wrong. As my dear mother used to say, it is not so hard to do the right thing as it is to know what is right to do. As a student, I was conflicted. On one hand, most of my classmates who were better informed and more articulate than I about the war were conscientious objectors. Their protests took courage, so I did not see them as cowards or traitors. On the other hand, my gut told me that the Vietnam thing was wrong, but I was not able to justify not serving my country. I chose to serve holding that U.S. foreign policy was above my pay grade and that the unlawful order ethics class had provided me with an active duty conscientious objector card. In 1967, I graduated from UC Berkeley, was, commis <coughs> was commissioned ensign, and reported to Civil Engineer Corps Officer School, Port Wanamey, where I received training in construction management. At the Military Justice School in San Diego, I learned about the Uniform Code of Military Justice. At the end of the year, I reported to Mobile Construction Battalion 71 at Davisville, Rhode Island as engineering officer. While preparing for combat duty, I was sent to SEER School, S-E-R-E, -E, in Cherry Point, North Carolina, for training in survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. After two days, Lieutenant Joe Clay took me aside and told me to my face that I had a chip on my shoulder and was not a team player. He went on to say that in combat, there was no room for ego or attitude, that we needed to stick together, work as a team, have each other's back. His candor and directness and prior combat experience gave him credibility in my eyes and gave me another defining lesson about service. As engineering officer, I had to know my job as well as make sure others knew theirs, technically. Most of my men knew their jobs, but there were a few characters or comedians whom I had to manage without causing their loss of face or, or loss of respect, both ways. One of my draftsmen, engineering aide first class Peoples, a quietly competent black enlisted man from Bill Philadelphia, displayed calm, hit the calm demeanor, neat appearance, and exemplary work performance that went beyond the call of duty. He was at one end of the spectrum. At the other was a southern white supremacist lieutenant who often reported for duty late, sloppily dressed and drunk, and who referred to the Vietnamese as gooks. My Vietnam experience taught me about American diversity and countered the popular notion that men and women in uniform think alike. Quite the contrary. Never have I met so many individuals with more disparate opinions and backgrounds than those I knew in the service. We got along because we needed to. My last tour as Public Works Liaison Officer was a safe, 
comfortable, and uneventful white male desk job and a return to the suffocating, boring conservatism where I started. Don't get me wrong, I love my country, I love the Navy, but I was in doubt about what I was doing most of the time. My experience was unforgettable because it made me grow. Thank you. Please rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn, There is More Love Somewhere. Oh, so now 95. <laughs> there is more love somewhere. There is more. actually always wanted to do that. I'm, <laughs> I might be a frustrated cabin attendant, so <laughs> please be seated. Thank you. I never paid much attention to Memorial Day. It was just another Monday I didn't need to be at school or at work. And even though both my parents served in the military and my uncle had spent his entire abbreviated adult life as a Marine, I attribute my willful, willful ignorance to privilege. No one in my immediate family had died in war, and the middle and upper middle class kids I grew up with were often able to marshal the resources necessary to avoid the draft. I watched the horrors of Vietnam unfolding nightly on the news, but this nightmare was happening to someone else in some foreign land I was hard pressed to identify on a map. Memorial Day began to mean something to me when it became a federal holiday, and as a student of history, I researched its origins. I discovered that this day was a commemoration rather than a celebration. It signaled a recognition, rare in this jingoistic culture, that war was about death and destruction, about communities obliterated and lives cut short, 
about young people who sailed off in dress uniforms and returned in sealed coffins. I probably had an early inkling of this, of the high cost of battle. When growing up in the immediate aftermath of World War II, I knew that some of my playmates came from single parent families. Few people, at least in that neighborhood, got divorced, and unwed mothers were as rare as unicorns. So the lack of a father in the home generally meant one thing, a fatality on the battlefield. My grandparents admonished me to be extra kind to these kids because they were dealing with losses I could barely wrap my young mind around. Regrettably, we don't always retain the lessons we're taught as children, lessons about kindness and compassion, about putting yourself in another's shoes. Because as I grew older and our country became embroiled in an unpopular and divisive war, I became more rigid in my thinking. I conveniently ignored the multiple and complex reasons why some people were shipped off to fight while others were not. I neglected much that I understood about how race and class operate in this country and how dependent, dependent our war machine is upon the existence of a permanent underclass, expendable as cannon fodder. Becoming involved in the anti-war movement and caught up in, in self-righteous fervor, I carelessly clumped together politicians, generals, and foot soldiers, marking each as equally culpable for what was unfolding before our eyes. I have few regrets about my anti-war activities. In my turbulent teens and 20s, opposing the war was one of the few things my parents and I were in complete agreement about. I'm especially proud of the actions I participated in that brought thorny questions of war and peace into classrooms and other public spaces. At our best, my friends and I tried to engage constructively with those with whom we had fundamental disagreements. I also, however, participated in activities that decades later I'm still uncomfortable describing in detail. They were, in fact, illegal. And while my comrades and I firmly believed that our actions were driven by an evolving revolutionary consciousness, they were often destructive and self-defeating. That said, I've come to terms about these actions, largely because institutions were our target. What I do regret, however, and what causes me to feel a profound sense of shame to this day is how I behave towards people, how my privileged position allowed me to behave. I remember all too vividly screaming baby killer at young men in uniform, men my age, men who might have grown up to be Joe or Mike or Howard, cherished members of our beloved community. I shouted invective at these youngsters, never once stopping to ask myself why they were in the military or questioning the circumstances that led them from the relative safety of civilian life to the perils of war. Had they simply come out on the short end of the lottery stick, drawing a number that could easily lead to death? My reactions tended to be more extreme when I encountered young white soldiers, forgetting the outsized role that class played in who went and who got to stay home. I also blocked out of my self-righteous mind the critical fact that soldiers are not just sent into battle to kill, they're also sent to die. Although I remain convinced that the Vietnam War was evil, I wish I had managed to conjure up the same degree of empathy and compassion that I had for the Vietnamese for these young men. Now we're witness to another war in a country many of us have paid little attention to. As people who yearn desperately for peace, how do we come to terms with death and destruction once again visible on the nightly news? How do we cheer each Ukrainian victory and at the same time recognize that these precious victories cost the lives of young Russians sent to die at the behest of a leader whose ego and falsehoods know no bounds and whose every action defies common decency? Is there such a thing as a righteous war? After Vietnam, it's hard to imagine. This reflection reminded me that in my 76 years on this scarred earth, there's never been a time of prolonged peace. As I weep for the children of Mariupol and the children of Uvalde, I weep as well for our country and our world. As our choir sang to us, when will we ever learn?
Let us end our time of worship together by acknowledging and giving thanks for all that is good and beautiful and peaceful around us, for the challenges we face with grace and fortitude, and for the love and support of our UU community and the community we are striving to build in peace and security for all. As people of faith and goodwill, we have much to ponder and critical work to do to help change and perhaps heal this shattered nation. And as you venture out into this world we share, a world at war in so many fronts, may the light of love shine upon you, out from within you, be gracious unto you, and bring you peace. For this is the day we are given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And please rise, put your hand on your heart, on the shoulder of a neighbor. If you have permission, hold hands, and let us call out a blessing. Thank you everyone for being with us this morning.